and welcome to the March 1st Board of Douglas County Commissioners 530 business meeting. This is Commissioner Kelly, and I'm going to turn it over to our vice chair. Commissioner Reed and I are both unable to be at the courthouse today, so we're going to turn it over to our loan commissioner who is there, Commissioner Willie, to um, chair the meeting, and I'll do that now. Commissioner Willie? Thank you. So I am Vice Chair Karen Willey, Commissioner, and I am the, the only one in the room here, but we do have the other two commissioners here on Zoom. Um, I want to welcome everyone, those of you who are here for our earlier work session on private roads, um, and welcome to the County Commission meeting for March 1st. If you haven't already gotten one, there are paper copies of the agenda available next to the coffee as you came in, um, and those can be helpful uh, for following the agenda. Um, Overall, we take uh, we have a consent agenda, and then we will take general public comment, and then get to our uh, regular agenda items, of which we have four. I do have a, a fairly unusual announcement to make about our regular agenda, and I'd like to go ahead and make that now before we get started. Is that item three point one, which is the CUP? I'll read it. <clears throat> CUP for landfill use at 631 North 950 Road has been withdrawn by the applicant. We will not be hearing that item tonight. Uh, they are no longer seeking uh, that permit for that use. Uh, I do want to make just a couple of uh, quick notes about that or comments just to put that in context. I know there was a tremendous amount of public input for this particular item, and I did spend quite a bit of time um, uh, being out there and talking with neighbors and, and viewing the site. Um, I got back with as many of you as I could have, but there were still many that I did not from, from email. Uh, there were three kind of main issues that got raised with that item. Some were about the quarry use itself. Some were about the, the, the uh, material that was proposed for the fill, which is that clean rubble fill, and some were specific to the location. And I just wanna point out that uh, the quarry, uh, use continues with uh, without the CUP that's being asked for. That is operating off of a CUP conditional use permit from 1975 that is open-ended and has very few restrictions or protections. And that is beyond the ability of this commission to, uh, to dive into. So that, um, that CUP does continue to exist and that quarry still has the same rights that it had before. And I, I mentioned that only because many of the concerns that were raised were about the quarry use. And unfortunately we don't have any ability to tackle that at this time. So I just wanna be, for people to be clear on that. But if you've come for that item, uh, we will not be hearing public I, public comment specifically for that item because it's withdrawn. However, we do take general public comment, and that will be coming up soon. And you're welcome to sign up um, here. There's a paper copy. If you would like to have three minutes and address anything on that topic, you are certainly welcome to, or any other topic that is not on our agenda. And to that point, I have a couple of um, rules to read. So each item, action item on the agenda, of which there are now only three, will offer an opportunity for relevant public comment about that topic. And we ask that you wait until that topic comes up for discussion. Um, additionally, close to the start of our meeting, we invite people to, uh, to provide general public comment to the commission, which is a time for addressing issues not on today's agenda, but related to general county business. Public comment will not be recorded or shared on the county's YouTube site to ensure compliance with YouTube's content policies, but we will hear you out. To hear public comment, individuals can also join us live on Zoom. They can also be here in the courthouse. Uh, we will first call on the people that are here in person, and then we will turn to any online commenters. Uh, those are encouraged to use the raise your hand function so that we can find you and move you into the panel so that you can be heard. Um, all public comments should be directed to the county commission of which that would be all three of us here. And we reserve the right to mute or remove speakers who may be vulgar, rude, or inappropriate. Uh, the public should also know that comments received by the commission during the meetings do not represent the views of Douglas County government. If any visual aids are used during the meeting, the presenter can share their screen. Um, please know that online participants will need to have a smartphone or computer to view those. Uh, materials, all of the materials in in addition to the agenda you have before you are published online and you are, those are available for your reference. So a recording of this meeting will also be available on our YouTube page and our website. And thank you for, for being here. So with that, we turn to our consent agenda. Thank you. 
could have saved you the work. Turn to our consent agenda and I'll ask first for other commissioners. Are there any items on the consent agenda that you would care to pull for further comment? No. And I'll no. also ask, go ahead. I will also ask in the public, are there any items that you would like to see pulled from the consent agenda for further uh, conversation? Seeing none, I would take a motion from a fellow commissioner to uh, accept the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda items one through seven. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And now we move on to general public comment. So I have a list here, and of course we can add to this as needed, um, but I have first Amy Bargman, do you regular agenda. And that brings us to item 3.2, since item 3.1 was withdrawn. Um, and that is from the planning department it is to reconsider a rezoning of 37.2 acres at 2384 North 200 Road from AG1 to AG2. And I believe we will have a presentation from Mary Miller. Is that correct? Yes, we're moving Mary Miller into the panel. Good evening, commissioners. Mary Miller, and I will be sharing my screen. And as you mentioned, this is a rezoning request from the Ag 1 Agricultural to the Ag 2 Transitional Agricultural Zoning District uh, for property at 2384 North 200 Road. The property is in the very eastern edge of Douglas County, and it's uh, on the north side of Highway 56 North 200 Road. Um, the notification area extended into Johnson County, so we did notify property owners in that area as well as the Johnson County Planning Office. Uh, this is an image of the property. It contains to the northwest corner, we have stands of mature trees. We also have a wooded stream corridor and uh, mature trees in the southeastern corner. It's developed with one residence and it has about 37.2 acres. And this property contained 40 acres until in 1937, KDOT acquired right-of-way for Highway 56. And when they took their right of way, it reduced the size to 37.2 acres, which at the time had no impact on their division or land development options. However, due to changes in our regulations, uh, primarily the change in 2006 when we adopted the certificate of survey process, and then changes in 2020 where we um, instituted two different agricultural zoning districts and made minimum parcel sizes for each, 20 acres for the Ag 1 and 10 acres for Ag 2. And now this has had an impact on their ability to divide their land. There are no land divisions in the sub land division options in the subregs for property that's zoned Ag 1, except through the exemptions. And the exemptions include things such as you can divide any land you want for farmland or agricultural purposes. You can divide land for a cemetery or for right of way, or you can do the agricultural subdivision boundary survey. And that is the one exemption survey that results in a buildable parcel. And the requirement for that is that you have a minimum of 20 acres. And due to the acquisition of the right of way, this property cannot be divided as zoned because it does not have the required 40 acres. And since the agricultural subdivision boundary survey is an exemption from the subregs, the variance policy the procedures in the subdivision regulations don't apply. And so that's why they are requesting this rezoning. This is a graphic of a concept plan the applicant provided early on in the process, you know, their, what they'd really wanted to do at that time. And we noted to them this is not likely to be possible because in order to divide in the Ag 2 district, if the zoning is approved, you have two options. One is a um, homestead exemption survey, which could be done to remove the house. However, you would have to have the required frontage and you would need the full frontage on North 300 Road. And you could create a parcel with a minimum of 10 acres. However, to get back to the house, it'd probably be more than that. And so we let them know that it looks like it'd be simple to divide it into two parcels. Three may be more challenging if impossible. And the applicant then noted that they would be willing to just divide it into two parcels.
So with our rezoning reviews, we look at the golden factors and the criteria and the zoning regulations. And one is, is it compatible with the zoning and land use of nearby properties? Um, the subject property is surrounded on the north and the west um, by other properties, 10 acre parcels that are zoned Ag 2. It's adjacent to or across the road from a larger parcel that is zoned Ag 1. And to the east, we have Johnson County. And I did not evaluate the, the land uses in Johnson County. And as we look on the graphic on the right, we can see the land uses. It is primarily agricultural and woodlands. The parcels that uh, abut this, the adjacent parcels, are they all contain a residence plus grassland or woodland, except for the one just to the north that doesn't have a residence. And, and then the rest of the area is agricultural uses. And the proposed rezoning and residential use would be compatible with the zoning and land uses in the nearby area. And then we look at the character of the area due to the fact that it's adjacent to Johnson County, we're just looking at one mile to the north and south and west. Uh, the area is bisected with uh, roads, higher classification roadways. We have US Highway 56 running east and west. And then we have um, a minor arterial, uh, County Route 33 or Highway 33, uh, running south of Highway 56. Um, it's 2300 Road South. Uh, so the area is well served by higher classification roadways. There is some floodplain in the south part um, along 2300 Road. And if you look at the arrangement of the residential uses, they primarily cluster along 2300 Road, and then some are located in this intersection, and then there's some scattered along the other roadways. The proposed rezoning would be compatible with and would maintain the character of the area. Other review criteria we look at is, um, is the, what is the suitability of the property to the uses to which it is currently restricted under its current zoning? And in this case, the Ag 1 and Ag 2 zoning districts permit basically the same uses. There's very limited differences in the uses. Uh, the difference primarily is that you can create smaller parcels in Ag 2. And so the property is well suited for uses that are allowed in both districts. We look at how long has the property been vacant as zoned. Um, the property has been used as agriculture and the residence on it was built in 1972, so it is not vacant. And we look at what would be the detrimental impacts of the rezoning. And with most residential rezonings, uh, one of the detrimental impacts is the additional traffic on township roads. In this case, um, the property abuts East 2400 Road on the east, which is a Johnson County Road. And the Johnson County Public Works Division indicated they had no concerns with the additional access points or traffic on the road. And then on the south, it would be adjacent to Highway 56. Uh, so there should be no detrimental impacts with the rezoning. And then we look at what would be the gain to the public versus a hardship to the applicant if the rezoning is denied. And um, since there's no detrimental impacts identified, there'd be no gains to the public. And the hardship to the applicant would be just that they cannot divide their land. Uh, they would have to keep it as a large parcel. They could divide it into the two parcels that they would uh, prefer. And then we look at what is the impact on environmentally sensitive lands. And as I mentioned, there are stands of mature trees in the Northwest. There's a stream corridor and stands of trees in the Southeast. Um, this is um, high quality soils or prime farmland, they're class two soils. So these would be the environmentally sensitive lands on the property. If the property were divided through a certificate of survey, um, building envelopes are required and these exclude environmentally sensitive lands and um, up to 40% of the property, at least if we have that many environmentally sensitive lands. It would be possible to develop this property without impacting the environmentally sensitive lands, except that an access drive would need to cross in order to reach East 2400 Road. And uh, the building permits, when they go through zoning and codes, they also review them for their impact on environmentally sensitive lands. So it should be possible to divide this property into the proposed two parcels uh, without impacting the environmentally sensitive lands. And then what is the conformance with the comprehensive plan? Um, chapter two um, has us manage land resources to maintain their natural functions, protect high quality agricultural lands, and protect continuous amounts of agricultural land in rural areas. And the um, agricultural land in this case is not contiguous to other agricultural land. It's actually adjacent to 
10 acre parcels that are developed residentially, but have some agricultural uses on them. Most of those properties, the ones that don't have woodland um, appear to be used for hay. The subject property itself is hay. And then the high quality agricultural soils, as I mentioned, those could be protected even if it's divided through a certificate of survey, except that an access drive would, uh, would have to cut through those. And then in the growth management chapter uh, to develop, to protect the uh, rural character, um, to seek conservation of sensitive lands, to minimize agricultural land conversions to non-agriculture uses, and to maintain working lands and high quality soils for future generations. And as noted in the staff report, when we look at the word minimize, that takes some interpretation. And you know, it doesn't say to prohibit agricultural land conversion. And so um, in some cases, it may be appropriate uh, for instance, in staff's opinion, if you're in an infill location where the surrounding properties are um, you know, smaller parcels that are used for residential uses, and especially if you have access to a higher classification roadway, so you're not impacting the township roads, it may be appropriate to uh, have that conversion, even though I don't know if it would meet the definition, as everyone would see it, of minimizing it. And then the residential section of the comprehensive plan of uh, the goal is to provide housing opportunities while conserving the overall rural character of Douglas County. And I think in this case, given the nature of the adjacent properties and the limited land division that's being proposed, um, it would be a one way to provide housing opportunities while conserving the overall rural character. And then um, in 2020, when the zoning regulations were changed, uh, we did add a criteria that we would look at the suitability for agricultural uses um, when we zoned from Ag 1 to Ag 2. And that way we could protect the higher quality agricultural properties. And um, in this case, I'm just gonna put what these colors are. I don't have it written here. Um, in figure one, the green area is a prime farmland. The blue is statewide importance. In figure two, this is a class two soils is what the conference of plan considers or classifies as high quality soils. Um, in three, commodity crop index and the blue areas have the higher rating, which that does include some of the woodlands. And in four, the environmentally sensitive lands. And this is what we look at because these would preclude agriculture. Uh, we wouldn't want to do agriculture in the stands and mature trees or the stream corridor or in this case, the residents and the residential outbuildings as well. And so when we went through this, it appears that about 56% of the property is well suited for agricultural uses. However, we don't have our lease system established yet. So this is kind of a subjective evaluation. The Planning Commission voted unanimously at the January 23rd meeting to forward this rezoning to the Board of County Commissioners with a recommendation of approval. And so that concludes my presentation. And I believe the applicant is present in person tonight. Thank you, Mary. Do uh, fellow commissioners have any questions for Mary before we open uh, and call the applicant up? Okay, and who is our applicant, Mary? Oh, here we go. Oh. Uh, come on up to the podium and tell us your name if you don't mind. Um, I'm Lucas Lovern. Uh, I live in Eudora. Anything you'd like to share about the property or the project that wasn't covered in Mary's report? Um, I don't think so, other than the fact uh, that it had been sitting, the house had been sitting vacant for the past three or four years, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys don't make it out, uh, maybe not that far uh, east, uh, but it that has come a long way since we have got the property. We've completely uh, redone the house inside and out and cleaned up the property quite a bit since we've had it uh, just, you know, make it look a little better and uh, with hopes of, of getting this rezoning approved. So thank you. Thank you. We may have questions later, but feel free to have a seat and we'll see if we get that far. Okay. So. Commissioners, do you have any comments or questions before we go to public comment? Yes, Commissioner Kelly, I don't. No questions from me. Thanks. Okay, with that, I will open this item up for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak for three minutes on this item? Is there anyone online? No one? All right, with that, I will close public comment and bring it back to the commissioners for a discussion or a vote.
this is Commissioner Reed. Um, I don't think I have much to say other than I just uh, appreciate that um, staff time um, and trying to figure out kind of what's possible given the um, the size of the land. And so it sounds like there's been good communication between staff and the applicant about you know what a path forward looks like. Um, and I think that this. Um, request to rezone is reasonable and, and makes sense for the property in the area. Thank you. Commissioner Kelly? I'm happy to make a motion. I would be happy to hear one. All right. <laughs> um, I'm going to adjust it. What's in our packet is not quite right, to my knowledge. Uh, wait a minute. Almost there. Uh, this motion to approve the request to rezone Z2200401, approximately 37.2 acres at 2384 North 200 Road from Ag 1 Agricultural to Ag 2 Transitional Agricultural, um, based on the findings presented in the staff report and adopt resolution 2309. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion passes 3 0. Thank you. And that puts us to the, the next item on our agenda, which is uh, zoning and codes. We will have a presentation from Tanya Voigt, our zoning and codes director. It's to consider allowing an additional residence to take access from a private road, East 773 Road. Can I request share screen? I should be able to. I'll try again. Oh, it worked. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Tanya Voigt, the Zoning and Codes Director for Douglas County. Um, we just did an hour long work session um, identifying private roads. So I don't have much of a formal application, um, you know, to, to discuss all seven properties here today, but I do have um, a formal request um, regarding E773 road. Uh, the Mitchell's property fronts in 2050 road and is vested and is buildable today. If they choose to construct an entrance from the public road in 2050, they would be granted a building permit. Because of the site constraints and sensitive lands, which is in your packet, it shows the old growth forest that um, fronts in 2050 road, uh, the applicants or the um, property owners, the Mitchells are requesting the shared maintenance of private road E773. The Mitchells recently surveyed the property to determine the true location of the access easement. The survey shows the easement centered on the property line between the Mitchell and Bond properties. Typically, private roads are traveling entirely on someone else's property to get access to their residence, but in this case, they own half of the private road. The existing private road could be widened enough to allow the Mitchells to tra travel entirely on their own property, but it doesn't address shared use or future maintenance of the road. The Mitchells are requesting approval of an additional residence to take access from E773 Road. Approval of this request, um, as we talked in the work session, may generate approval of um, seven additional sites. Um, so uh, the Mitchells are here, as well as Carolyn Bond and the Beardensons, who are both property owners that currently take access and maintain E773 Road. Thank you, Tanya. And because this is coming from Zoning and Codes, you are the applicant in this case, is that correct? Um, I would say that I am making a request on behalf of a landowner, correct. Okay. Uh, do we have any uh, comments or questions from other commissioners? We might need to see them if you wanna stop sharing the screen. Commissioner Reed, um, I do not have any questions for Tanya. I don't either. Thank you. All right. Um, I would like to open this up for public comment. Public comment then would also probably include uh, all of the residents and potential residents for Road East 773. So if we'd like to come up and state your name and um, take three minutes to uh, give us give us some information.
My name is Carolyn Bond and I live on, oh, sorry. I'm, my name is Carolyn Bond and I live at, um, on 773 Road, LeCompton. Is that enough? Sure. Okay. I just, I'm not a public speaker, so I just jotted down some thoughts and um, thoughts and opinions that I'll just read if that's okay. The Barons and the Bonds have done the upkeep of private road 773, which is also our driveway for over 46 years. We first moved there, when we first moved there, the road was a narrow one laid road. If, if, if we met each other, one had to back up. A couple of years in or so later, we added the forked entryway from the county road on the Easter, Eastern side, which is actually on my property. Through the years, we have worked to clear trees, underbrush, et cetera, to widen the road as it, as it now as it is now it is wide enough to meet and pass each other coming and going every year we work at keeping saplings and underbrush cleared so we can mow the edges of the drive my husband used his bulldozer in earlier years to do major clearing since his passing passing peter has maintained the drive and i pay him for my share of the expenses the expenses for 46 years would total total to be a significant amount, including asphalt chips, gravel, grading, or building, um, or, or building, et cetera. We also have uh, put in two large tubes to help drain water away from the driveway. If you look at the aerial views of the drive in the mid seventies, you will see a narrow one lane road as it was originally when we moved out there. We have had full responsibility for the upkeep of our drive all these decades. The um, township nor the county has ever done any of the upkeep. It is a nice and inviting driveway because we have worked hard to create it through the years. We want to keep it as our private road and drive and not add more traffic and wear and tear on it. If a home is built on the property using our driveway, the construction trucks, cement trucks, dozers, backhoes, et cetera, would or could create damage and expense. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone like to be next? My name is uh, Peter Berenson. And I live uh, to the south uh, of uh, Carolyn Barnes and the Mitchell's property. I want to tell you a little bit about the history of 773 Road, because I think all these things together with water availability, I think are essential uh, elements to consider. Uh, when we bought the property in 1975 from Greater Midwest Corporation, uh, they, the, and the corporation owned between 500 and 550 acres of land. Um, 773 Road, if you look at the old map, and it uh, started in uh, 1857. 773 Road actually started on 2015 Road, it goes to our property and to the property to the south of us and meets up with uh, North 1851 Road. Over the years, uh, land was sold first, uh, Carolyn and we bought land, and then later, the rest of the property, 500 acres, was bought by one person. The uh, person we, in the beginning, we used the road even to 1851 road to get out. And when that land was sold to this person, he uh, just told us he didn't really like us using the land. So we started using the road to uh, 2015 road more. Uh, so 773 Road 
shows on the map now that I have here that it ends halfway down my property. It doesn't even enter, and I don't know the reason for that uh, at all. So that's a question I have. Then uh, at some point the uh, road was named and that was done of course for uh, allow uh, firemen, medical people to find the homes easier and also for other purposes. At some point, a signed private road was pasted under the 773 road. I never asked for it, but I recall it just appeared. So then I, at one time, got in touch with uh, Tony Avoid, and uh, I got a mail from her, and I read that to you, and it says, East 773 Road, is recorded for access to, for two residences. Private roads were established in 1994, so no additional res residences would be permitted to use 773 Road. I'm sorry. We may ask you back for some other questions, but I'm afraid our three minutes has been up, but we may ask you back for more. Oh. <laughs> I think we're ready for the next speaker. Oh, okay. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Hey, come on up and tell us your your name. Sure. So, and are you are you wanting? Sorry, are you wanting three eight, three minutes each or are you wanting to tag team for three minutes? I'll let you confer. Well, I think originally we had, we didn't realize. We felt okay. like we were the petitioners and we were, we didn't realize. Let me ask Tanya <laughs> to come back up and, or or, or Sarah. Um, are, are we on? Do, do we have an applicant on this or is the we, Zonian Code so, the applicant? Because uh, that will mad, it's okay. make a difference for how much time. I don't believe we have an applicant. So yeah, I yeah, traditionally we don't no consider this applicant. them the applicant. Okay. This is this is zoning and codes who's the applicant. So okay. I would say they okay. should so stay to three have... minutes since particularly since we asked other folks to stay to three minutes as well. And we do and, deserve the right to ask you back for questions and clarifications, actually anyone that spoke. So but you could each have three minutes, but I might ask one of you to sit down and then okay. Come we're back gonna later. then one second, please. Okay. Each have three minutes. Okay, let's see what I'm going to do with this. Okay, we'll work it out. All right, let's. Can you, start? you want to start? Yep. Um, you state your name. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cotter Mitchell. Um, I, I'm a resident of Douglas County, of Vinland, Kansas at this point. Um, and this is my wife, Phaedra, and we're we, uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today about our request for the use of East 773 Road to access a future residence. We wanted to thank um, Zoning and Codes, Tanya Boyd, for all the research and the presentation that we witnessed. This. It was, a, it was an amazing amount of work. And Commissioner Willie for coming out for an actual site visit, which just, you know, you, you can look at all the maps and pictures and it's we actually are on the land but we have I mean, we have a much shorter history to share uh, but we've had the land um, we've been looking for land for about you know, for several years for retirement plans a um, piece of property that we could build a modest residence on and it's something that would allow us to age in place an ag building and uh, to store farm equipment tinker in and we most we mostly wanted forested land and um uh, enough open acreage for some specialty crops farm. Um, we, in April of 2021, we were alerted to the, to this um, property with an address of 2043 East 773 Road. It was listed with an address. Um, and we made arrangements to look for it the next day, look at it the next day. Um, the land was 
perfect for what we what we asked for what we were looking for it was the first parcel we'd considered that would allow us to pursue our goals without having to destroy part of the forest that was the right size and there was a mix of field and forest already and it was on a private road which was the icing on the cake for us at the time and also the biggest hiccup in this whole process mm -hmm. so which was in, it was important to us at the time because we um, were dealing with a stalker on a public road that we lived on and so the private road felt like it was it was meant to be the county gis map um, showed that the entire road was located on our parcel of land we were assured by the seller there were no hidden issues the title search was clean the appraisal was good the appraiser said to break the land up and build multiple residences on it was the was the best land usage um, bank so we got a bank loan signed the documents and closed on the property in june of 2021 um, and we were confident that we'd done our due diligence at that point um yeah but, you want to stop and so let her get the timer started again sure. and then uh, give us your name please um, yes, I'm Phaedra Mitchell, and I am with Cotter. <laughs> so uh, at this point, we're we're in September of 2021. Can I start? Yep. yep okay, great. Yep. So we had reached out to Zoning at Codes to make sure that we were proceeding with plans respectful of the rules and regulations. Uh, specifically, we wanted to know what the width requirements were for the culvert under our drive that access the private road. And that's when we learned we could have access from the private road to build everything except the residence, according to county code. So we learned that it was, in fact, a buildable lot, but it would require an installation of an entirely new driveway connecting to the public road below the bluff. So because of the lay of the land, almost all of the north property line is floodplain. Uh, the new driveway would have to run parallel to the existing private roadway. And I think this was all brought up in, in Tanya, uh, what Tanya presented earlier. Um, so there's one access point to the uh, that would connect to the private road, but that would um, be detrimental. I mean, if we were to do that, it would be cost prohibitive and it would destroy the environs of the bluff of that old growth forest. So, um, and this is the very same bluff that's featured in that, uh, the Douglas County Newcomers Guide, um, the 2020 Green Spaces article. So. I think a lot of people really like that road. Um, anyway, this came as quite a shock to say the least. All the legal documents and groundworks with the seller, assessor, title company, bank loan officer indicated that the private road was to be used by three parties for residential access. Um, so then we started our whole journey with the county, um, learning about private roads and codes and regulations and then the history of ownership of our land. And I gotta say this process, even though it's been challenging has really been met with a lot of kind people that um, really just have a great appreciation for the challenges of private roads thank you um let's see we we did retain counsel to look over our situation and advise us of our options with residential access from the road and we also reached out to the neighbors uh carolyn and peter um to uh, introduce ourselves and share our plans and ask about the history of the road and shared maintenance as spelled out in the easement. Um, and we met with them a month later, so we're in October, and we learned that they uh, that Carolyn and her spouse were the original owners of our property. And then when they divided it, creating the parcel we owned, it was sold to their friends, the Red Wines, who had plans to build a home on it, but they sold before building. And then the subsequent owner ended up incarcerated and it sounds like during his incarceration time, the private roads regulations changed again. And that guy probably was unable to petition the county to ensure his land was included for residential access from the private road during that code change. And we also learned that Peter's maintained the private dr drive since Mr. Bond passed away over 20 years ago. Um, he did say he didn't want to share the road despite the easements uh, in the agreement. Yes, is my time up? Ha, that's what I get, okay. I also, yeah. Thank you, though, and we Welcome may have back. more questions. Um, That's I, hard when you. <laughs> I would start that. with a couple of questions for Tanya, if you are willing, and then I'll open it for other commissioners also. Mm -hmm. So I know we just had a 
full hour primer on private roads, but uh, for people who are kind of coming in for this item but did not hear it earlier, can you talk about the difference between a, a driveway and a private road and landlocked parcels? So um, a driveway is on private property. Um, a residential property owner typically takes access from that private driveway on private land to get to and from their house. It comes off of a public road. Um, our, um, all of our building permits today under the new building, um, any of the new codes requires public road frontage. Uh, uh, private roads are access easements that have been literally approved since before 1972 in Douglas County upon the initiation of the subdivision regulations. Um, they've been allowed, you know, in different versions by different names, um, and they typically cross someone else's property to get to their property via easement only on private land. Um, a lot of times those lots are landlocked parcels. So they're crossing several other private landowners land to get to a landlocked parcel uh, to, per to build a home. I have a, a follow-up question. Can you talk to me about the, the Mitchell's parcel in particular and how it is buildable now and why this particular request? Yeah, so um, this parcel has road frontage uh, in 2050 Road. It was divided and meets the acreage requirements and the road frontage requirements to have a completely vested buildable lot today. Um, there, there's a lot of complications to the current private road situation. The property was listed um, by a realtor. Um, they had uh, constructed an entrance off of the private road. Um, them as landowners didn't realize that um, they may not be able to use that for residential access. Um, they can go to and from for ingress and egress as much as they want on a private road. They have easement. That easement is valid for their use. The issue with our building codes is previously, um, this was approved under a retroactive approval for private roads where building permits were issued on a private road that was not approved by the Board of County Commissioners. We have no Board of County Commission minutes approving this specific road and the number of houses that it was allowed um, to be permitted on that. So how we interpret that with the regulations is that um, what existed at the time of the resolution for the retroactive approval is what the um, what what stands today. So two houses existed. I believe one was built in seventy two, another maybe in seventy four. Those existed at the time. Those essentially um, have the right to utilize that private road. Um, what our office doesn't have the authority to approve is a third residence. If um, the landowners typically private roads were approved up to three residences, um, most a majority of ours are approved up to three. Um, this one specifically because it was not um, didn't go directly to the Board of County Commissioners um, is not approved for three. And Tanya, is there an existing agreement about that private road? Yeah, so there is a handshake verbal agreement for um, cost of maintenance between the two um, residences, residences that take access from that road today. Can I also ask um, Phaedra Mitchell to come back up? I, I think there was a document perhaps that, um, that you had found with the Register of Deeds perhaps. Can you tell us what you have? So um, you have to come right up to the mic. Right up to the mic. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so... We actually have more than a gentleman's agreement or a handshake agreement. Um, this this is why we were so sure of ourselves in this mm -hmm. at the time. Um, but we have an easement, two different easements. One of them is just recreated and rewritten uh, for access across and using the roadway between the our prop, what is now our property, the Red Wines was were the folks in the bonds Come on, and then, really close to the mic and then uh mr berenson and linda would have access uh also so it's a shared three-way easement for access and maintenance and expenses where did that agreement come from that came from the register of deeds um, okay. it is book 408 page 200 so that was filed probably in the 70s this when... one one was filed in 77 and then when the land was split again, it was divided in 19, or it was written again in 1987. 
Okay, thank you. You bet. And I'm going to open it for other commissioners. I've been hogging the mic. Do you have questions or comments? This is Commissioner Kelly, and just a question for Tanya. Tanya, in these cases, I mean, I understand that the, I think I understand that the challenges of these private roads is when properties do exchange hands. Are these agreements tied to the deeds at all? Sometimes they're actually on the face of the deed where it, it describes, you know, the meets and bounds description or rods description. And then sometimes the language is actually on the deed. Sometimes it's by separate instrument. The separate instruments are harder to find. Um, the reason that we couldn't honor the, the access easement that they have that was filed with register or deeds, we did see that. I think it was 1976 or 1977, is it didn't predate the old access easements that had to be filed before 1972 for residential access. So follow-up question to that, is there anything that we need to do in policy to make sure that these are attached to the deeds? I mean, I guess my concern is when properties exchange hands, we get into disagreements about whether we're going to maintain these roads or, or the, those kind of questions. And you may have answered this at the study session, and I'm sorry I couldn't attend today. It came up. Um, we, we, we don't necessarily have a tool in the Zoning and Codes office to make that a requirement. We encouraged uh, landowners to make sure that those documents are getting filed with the Register of Deeds. Um, and that they're taking them to the Register of Deeds and filing them. Um, but um, there is no requirement currently um, that, that would make that happen. But could we create a requirement? I mean, if, if planning and codes is making a recommendation, I would want the recommendation to include that it be filed, you know, that the agreement be filed with Register of Deeds. Yeah. Commissioner Kelly, this is Sarah. Uh, I think we could do it on the ones that zoning and codes um, brings forward and that there is commission approval on, but we I don't think we can do this on retroactively. All, well, and, and on we can do it moving forward, but I don't know that we could do it yeah, retroactively and on ones that um, you know, there's lots of private roads with private agreements that to try I don't know what what ability we would have to enforce that. Okay. Thank you. And there are thousands of easements filed on properties everywhere for agricultural use, um, all types of different ones. Um, and our office really typically does not get involved in the filing of easements. I do think that moving forward, if we bring these to you on a case-by-case -case basis and ask the commission to make a determination to allow additional residences, we could certainly make that a requirement on the ones coming forward. Thank you. Commissioner Reed, do you have anything or I'll, I'll have a follow-up question? Um, yeah, Tanya, can you just clarify, um, I accidentally closed out the tab and instead of going to refine the link, um, uh, sort of the order of upon turning on to East 70, 773 Road, what's the order of residences or, you know, who owns the property closest? I, it sounds like it's the Mitchells, right? Since they have frontage on the public road. That's correct. Um, so the Mitchells would be on the west side of the road directly to the east is a similar kind of sized parcel, which would be the bonds. And then um, south um, is a much larger parcel that um, Peter and his wife own. Okay. I was just trying to sort of visualize what the, you know, I heard the comment earlier about the um, impact on the the road potentially of whatever equipment and trucks would be coming in to build on the site. Um, so just trying to think about how much road that would be. Um, you know, I <clears throat> I appreciate Commissioner Kelly's question about, and I've, I've been thinking about it since our work session and what, if there are any policy solutions or if we're really just in a situation of kind of a um, few different weird periods of time that um, resulted in uh, this collection of private roads that all have maybe different issues. Um, and then to Sarah's point, the private agreements that um, <clears throat> vary in terms of documentation 
or shared understanding. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there are any clear cut um, policy options. I think for me and um, I, well, Commissioner Willie, you said you had another question. So let me just collect my thoughts more and turn it back over to you. Okay. Uh, so my question is when the decision was made to have by the county commission to have no more um, public or uh, private roads, and then also to not um, vest those properties that had not yet been built on within that time. Uh, some of these properties either own some of the property that is part of the private road, like in this case, or own the entirety of the property that the private road crosses. Was that considered a taking at the time? That seems very uh, legally difficult uh, in terms of, of property rights. Um, our county counselor actually has been involved in this specific request. Um, and there, I mean, um, there is some legal standing if it continued to move down the line and this ended up, you know, in court, that th that would be a case to be made. It certainly kind of rings something with me. Uh, so I would say on this particular property, and I know this is the first of several that we will probably get to talk about as they uh, come forward, uh, especially since the, the property is entirely buildable as it is though it would involve uh, building a road up a very steep erodible cliff in a, in a beautiful part of Douglas County. And we haven't mentioned, but the, uh, the, the road that 773 takes access off of is the Scenic River Road, so along the Kansas River Valley. So most of you can probably picture that, not so much by just the, the road designation number. Uh, so this property is buildable as it is. Uh, there will be a neighbor there, and, and that is not in question. They have legal access to use the private road for ingress and egress, not yet for, for residents. These two things together and the fact that they own uh, a good portion of that road already certainly lead me in a direction of saying that this is the, the right thing to do to allow a building permit on this uh, property. Uh, well, there's a building permit allowed on this property anyway, but to allow that to take access off of an existing road for a less impact than a new road, uh, I do think that that comes into a question of now we have neighbors that have to work something out, that there will be an impact on a private road. Uh, and that is something that the county does not specifically get involved with. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and yet those are discussions that that would need to happen if we approve this um, for it's, it's important to be a good neighbor. It's important to welcome a new neighbor. There are just conversations that would have to happen outside of this, depending on what we decide. So I'm gonna pitch it back to other commissioners for thoughts. I've already shown my hand. This is Commissioner Reed. Um, <clears throat> I'm with you, Commissioner Willie. I think that you just made some good points and helped articulate uh, a few thoughts that were in my head and um, I think given the totality of circumstances that this recommendation um, makes sense. This is Commissioner Kelly, and I take very seriously the recommendation on staff on these, these issues, because I know we have a lot of these and there's a lot to clean up. I, I would ask um, staff to look at some sort of policy moving forward that attaches them to the deed you know, and whether that's, I'm not interested in going back to every private road. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think it would be um, helpful to be clear, as clear as possible on, um, you know, what's expected of the neighbors if this would be approved by the county, um, you know, and we make a a change and, in, in, you know, and look at these each individually. I'd like just there to be some record. I don't want to you know, have something go back, you know, in 2068 or whatever it is, and then say, what was the agreement here? I'd like that to be really clear. So Commissioner Kelly, um, one of the things we talked about earlier in the, the study session is that um, finding out that these are private roads and having that filed with the deed would be very helpful because that that is actually where much of this is falling down as properties change hands. But the county, I don't think, has any ability to require that there be an agreement on the management of private roads. Sometimes there are and sometimes there aren't. Am I misspeaking anything, Tanya? That's correct. Okay, it sounds like it should have been at the study session, so. 
there are many private roads that have no maintenance agreement and um, they just work through it. Sometimes only one landowner does all of the maintenance. Yeah, and I guess I'm not really interested in going back to all of those, but if we get any requests that come to us, that's what I'm interested in. I think that's it. I think that is something we can do. If this is something that zoning and codes brings forward to clarify and to put forward, I think that is something we could um, handle on the ones that we are asking for resolution on. And I think, you know, also with the violations, eventually there'll be some sort of documentation as to how we deal with those, I'd assume, Tanya. Yeah, um, my main question would be, um, we would let the private landowners work through that maintenance agreement on their own and just have a requirement, maybe before a building permit is issued, that um, the, the shared agreement or the maintenance agreement has been filed. Yeah, or maybe a period of time. I think that's something we could talk about as staff as okay. to what would be, you know, six months or something like that to in order to file something like that. And then my next question would be, what if they can't agree? And that's why I wouldn't want to tie the building permit to a time frame right. because it requires some collaboration mm -hmm. that may or may not be wanted. Correct. I think that's something I think maybe we could, I guess, commissioners can think about as we move through these is to, you know, at a certain point, you know, we you know, what leverage do we have to sort of require it? But I think we could talk through it um, as we tackle these tough, difficult issues. As I did in the study session, I would just encourage anyone who is impacted by a private road to create an, a maintenance agreement and also file it with the Register of Deeds. Um, that doesn't have to be fancy. I think that can be just something that is agreed upon between neighbors, but I think that is somewhat beyond our control. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? No questions or comments, but happy to make a motion. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, move to uh, approve. Let me read this, how it's worded. So I move to approve the East 773 Road located within an existing access easement uh is it actually i'm going to rewind tanya i am confused by the wording of this and maybe other commissioners are seeing it differently than me yeah, no i i i apologize commissioner i don't think the motion the motions moved correctly I, I think it is consider allowing an additional residence to take access from private road east 773 road and i think that you would want to um make sure that it's limited to three so that we don't get future requests. Okay, thank you. Let me try that again. Um, <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Reed, I move to approve the addition of um, uh, one residence with who can take access um, off of East 773 Road and um, allow a maximum allowing a maximum of three residential parcels along that private road of east 773. second all in favor aye, aye. aye. motion passes three zero thank you tanya thank you and that brings us to our item 3.4 which is an update on the title 10 funding with the lawrence douglas county public health and heartland community health Thank you, commissioners. Um, I asked Dan Partridge uh, with Lawrence Public Douglas County Public Health to be here to provide some additional information um, on Title X funding. And I know Julie Brandstrom with Heartland Community Health Center is here as well. So Dan, uh, Dan, I'll just turn it over to you to kind of walk commissioners through the material in the packet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, commissioners, for uh allowing us to come back tonight and close the loop on some of the questions that we received back on the, your January 11th uh, County Commission meeting. You have a, a meeting, or excuse me, a memo uh, that you should have received here this week uh, from us that outlined the answers to the, the questions that we uh, received. Now there was a broader conversation as well, and to kind of respond to that as well, Erica Dvorsky, who is the jointly appointed uh, member of the health board and currently serves as our vice chair is here as well. So thank you, Erica, for 
your community service tonight. And thank you for to Julie Branstom and Liz Kieber for being here to add uh, Heartland's Community Health Center's information to this conversation. So I don't want to uh, dig in, you know, too deeply into the memo, um, uh, but I will stand for questions if you have any on on the the, uh, the content that we provided for you. And you know, just briefly, that cover page of the memo talks about the question around what percentage of clinic services or do we see same day? Dan, could I have you go ahead and share the slides that you? presented um i don't um, okay i think sarah's going to save you but you can yeah he doesn't talk have, while she works on that thank he you he doesn't have the ability to do that so did you want do you you want to see the clinic wait time report commissioner no Moody? you can skip to the slides that will be part of a presentation I, I don't have formal slides we just have a couple things that were included some additional information that was included in the packet but I, okay. if you want me to share that, I can sh I can do that. Um, well, I mean, the commissioners have it. it on yeah, the they're just not technically slides. That's oh. all I'm saying. So they're well, just they're just it wasn't a formal presentation. It was just background material. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead then. Thank you. Is this what you were looking for? That would be great. Okay. Yes, that's that's one of the attachments to the memo that I sent, which uh, is looks like the wait time analysis that we have and. Um, you know, there's like 20 some rows there, so I don't want to go walk you through all of them, but I would say um, there's probably some language that we could have done a little bit better. So you have things like STI, STI treatment, and then down below STI testing, and what are what do they all mean? And so maybe some some clarification for you that first just STI number, that's the highest, 74% we're seeing same day. That is essentially someone coming into our clinic wanting to get tested for STIs and an RN saw them. The one at the bottom that says STI testing is essentially the same thing, but delivered through our APRN. So to the public, they got the same thing, but on our end, different staff at different levels um, provided that service. STI treatment, you see that it's 48%. Um, Sometimes when we, an STI test happens, it's a rapid test and it's known there. And of course you can't treat before you test and know what it is you're treating. And so sometimes that can happen all in that same day, but sometimes the test goes out, it takes a while to process and come back. That's why you see that number um, not, not as high as the, the STI number above. Um, Pregnancy tests about 30% of the time, and maybe just maybe conflating this with the Wichita State focus group, where they talked about um, convenience and timeliness and the responsiveness of getting in and the comment that well, if you call in early enough in a day, you could typically be seen same day. I think that's borne out in the numbers of roughly 20, 30% of same day service on our um, things like pregnancy tests. And, and supply refills and, and uh, the other uh, encounter counts there. Um, but it's not a universal that we're a same day clinic. And, you know, so I think this is trying to dispel that myth that everything happens the same day. Um, and when we compare it to the other services down below, um, they're roughly similar. Um, wait time uh, frequencies. And so I don't really know where your interest or issues or concerns lie on that. So I think it would probably be better if I just respond to your, your questions on that. On the uh, Wichita State um, work, that was in response to your question around why do people choose Lawrence Douglas Public County or Public Health for services? Really, it boils down to, um, there's one slide, if, that talks about um, results, strengths of LDCPH that really gets to, it's probably scrolled down a little more. That's really gets to what we asked them to do. Cost, convenience, quality of care. That was the, the, the uh, talking, that was the feedback we got from our clients. And I would say, um, yes, it was only 11 clients. You know, we wished it would have been more. We invited 
everyone who's been part of our family planning program over the past year to participate via the emails that we have for them. We had about 40 express interest and 11 show up um, out of, I think it was eight or 900 emails that we sent out. Um, for focus groups, you know, we were hoping for more, but it could have been uh, lower than that. Uh, it was a, a weather day. Um, and I would say, even with those qualifiers, I think we can lean on this as accurate because these are things that consistently we hear from our clients through the years. I mean, they have said these things to us for, for quite a while. And so there isn't a, a radical out of left field kind of data point in here that, that doesn't ring as something we've heard consistently in the past. The other question that was asked was around um, uh, staff uh, uh, surveys and the, the uh, morale of staff. And you have a handout or a uh, slide that talks about the comparison between our July 2022 uh, survey or employee satisfaction survey and January of 2023 for probably about 15 years now, every July, we complete an employee satisfaction survey. And so we were doing that again in 2022. Um, because the results were concerning to us, we decided many months ago to conduct a follow-up six months later in January. So you see that there. Um, we asked 22 questions across this survey um, and they're broken out in four domains around our values, job satisfaction, leadership, and then communication and involvement. And when you look at the, those four domains, um, values was the highest rated in July. Um, the way you kind of read these numbers is if everyone responded strongly disagree, strongly negative, that would have been a negative two number. Um, if it was all I disagree or I see it negatively, that would be a negative one, neutral zero, and then you go to the one and two as agree, strongly agree. So when you, the closer you get to zero, the more neutral that response is, and the closer you get to two, um, the better that response is. So values was our highest rank then and still is in January. It was about 1.56 in J July, and it's it was the one of the four domains that, that declined to down to 1.24. Um, but I would say in the interim between July and January, we have engaged in a strategic planning process where our four core values have changed and um, we kept one and, and brought in three new ones. And those three values, I think, were settled upon through that strategic planning process because we saw them as um, helpful in our pursuit of leading change, of pursuing our vision, achieving our mission. They were um, the values we believe, we being staff, that best helped us achieve our mission. And kind of as a consequence or side effect of that, they challenge me, they challenge our staff, they challenge our board to do better, to do differently, to, to step out of our comfort zones. So I think um, that's my narrative on why those no, those that number declined a little bit. A, they're new, and B, they're a bit challenging and and you know not um, perhaps as comforting as the as the old values were. Job satisfaction um, is one that I would say is the the hardest thing to budge. And so when I look at these numbers from January to July, the things that seem to be leading indicators are like communication and involvement and leadership. Those are things that we've actively been saying, all right, what can we do better? Sarah, and, can you scroll back up to the slide? Sure. Line? Thanks. Anyway, the point there is, is I see, I see leadership and communication and involvement where we saw the greatest improvement as things that it would be reasonable to say, oh, you can see those things uh, improve in the short term better than some of the longer term things like values and job satisfaction. But job satisfaction is our second highest scored domain, and it's at 0.86, which is, you know, 
majority of folks say they agree that they're they're satisfied with the job and the and the job environment. Um, that's what I would say there on the, on the survey. And then the last one was less a direct question, but um, it felt like it was important to uh, you know kind of respond to some questions and you know provide extra clarity on what percent of clinic services are represented when we say family planning or Title X and what are the remaining clinical services? So you see there those rows and uh, all the different groupings of all of our clinic services. And then you see a chart down below that talks about when we look at our, our workforce, our, our uh, payroll reports and how many hours are spent coded to family planning versus clinic overall, what kind of expenditure numbers are there for clinic versus family planning, what are the local tax support needed to support clinic versus family planning? That all gets to is 16 to 19% of clinic is what family planning has represented for us. Uh, do you have that in the slides also? Sure. That's that's right there. Okay, thank you. And, and then the, the chart above it really is to just make the point that our encounter trends overall uh, are declining. The, the couple of places where it looks like they're going up, one around pregnancy tests, that was a policy change on our end back in 2021, late 2021, where we went from an opt-in pregnancy test process to an opt-out. So if a, a woman came in for family planning services, they just got a pregnancy test. So our policy drove that, that spike you see in 2022. And then the other one was the, the around the LARCs, um, where the first three three years of numbers are really us counting um, IUDs that we removed. And in 2022, where we began inserting them as well, there were 26 insertions in that 71 number in 2022. And this was information that I had asked Dan to include in this packet, specifically because I, I do think that this helps um, paint a picture that probably needs to be fleshed out a, fleshed out a little more fully, which is why we wanted to have this conversation today, which was that overall sort of driving some of these these decisions were these issues about encounters going down overall. And, you know, in, in trying to monitor the clinic operations, which were a substantial part of the public health budget, how how family planning related into that with overall decrease in, in encounters and then, but yet knowing that that is just a portion of what happens at the clinic. So, you know, I think it's important to take away from this. This does not mean that the clinic at public, a, a clinic run by Lawrence Douglas, Pub, Lawrence Douglas County Public Health is going away completely that there will still be clinic services provided by um, LCDPH staff um, but that it is also important that fa Title X family planning services be provided in this community, and and do you know where do we have the ability to do that? And I th think there is universal agreement that is important that Title X services continue to be pro provided for in Douglas County. So um, I th I think this helps paint a little bit more of the picture in terms of what led to some of the conversation around uh, potential changes in clinic operations. Can I ask a quick question before we move off of this slide? You mentioned the pregnancy test uh, numbers going up because it was an opt in, uh, an opt opt out as opposed to an opt in. Mm -hmm. Is it the same for the STI treatment and testing? Is that number also increased? No, that's more a reflection of uh, emerging from COVID and having nursing capacity to see people. Um, you know, I think Sarah's comments provide uh, maybe perhaps a segue to Julie Brandstrom because I, she's here from Heartland and um, can provide information on their plans to um, work to restore or, you know, to carry the torch forward on uh, the Title X grant. And my last comment here would be, you know, Title X is a funding source and the services that it provides, we call family planning, they're They've been provided by LMH and Heartland for many, many years. So this, this isn't a this, this is about a funding stream to support uh, women's health in our community. That's been going on in a collaborative way for many years. So, 
me ask commissioners, do you have any questions for Dan before we have Julie come up and speak or we can hold those until the end? I have a question for Dan about the survey. The um, trying to figure out what page it is here. This is Commissioner Kelly. Can you tell me, Dan, on the survey of staff, I'm just curious, how many took the survey in July 22 and how many took it in January 23? Do you know that? Uh, not precisely. I know response rates in the top of my head a lot more. The response rate in July was high 90s. In, the, in uh, January, it was around 80% response. That reflects some of the methodology changes that we did. Um, to try to be more responsive to feedback we got about um, the process of ha just handing out the survey during an all staff meeting and asking people to fill it out before they left. That's how we got a high 90s percent rate. So I'm going to, don't hold me to it, but it was about 40 in July and around 30 in, Jan in January. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Commissioner Reed, any questions since I can't see you or I I will have one. She's also. nodding her head. No. Okay. Sorry. Right. No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just have a question about the strategic planning process. Uh -huh. Who was involved in that process? Who was involved? Uh, well, all staff have, were engaged in different, um, you know, dialogues, discussions through staff meetings and a half day retreat. Our leadership team met for a couple of full day retreats. Our health board and our health equity advisory board participated in um, an evening retreat along with um, kind of snippets of information at several board meetings along the way. Um, so it was, that's roughly what the process looked like. Do you have client representation on your board? On our health equity advisory board? I mean, it's easy to say yes because practically the entire community went and got a COVID shot from us. So if I call them a client, yes, but regular clients, no, that's that's our health equity advisory board. Okay, so uh, clients weren't especially reached out to during the strategic planning process. Would that be right? That's correct. Okay, so we just have the 11 that returned the survey for kind of our input to their thoughts on any part of the process. You mean on the 11 from the focus group? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, commissioners, any other questions for the moment? And then we have Julie Brandstrom to come and speak also. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and commissioners, while Julie comes up, I, I really appreciate her being here today. I, I didn't quite prep her for a formal presentation just to really sort of respond to questions as um, you know, I've continued to meet with public health and Heartland Community Health on on kind of the future of Title X and also Heartland's um, uh, presence in hopefully in the community health building. Julie? Yeah. Um, thanks so much for um, having us here tonight. Um, so late last year, Lawrence Douglas County Public Health uh, approached Heartland about the possibility of us taking over the Title X grant. Um, and for a variety of reasons, um, Heartland said yes. And these reasons included Heartland's experience with administering grants through the state. We already do that. Um, also the benefits of an integrated care model to patients that are seeking family planning services um, who don't have another primary medical provider. And finally, we felt that it was really important that these services were preserved in the community and that this funding stream was available to be able to offer these services at no cost or low cost uh, to community members. Um, to speak a little bit more about integrated care and our belief that um, an integrated care model enhances Title X, um, this specifically is important for folks who are medically uninsured. Um, we offer fees on a sliding scale according to household income. And um, so patients who are below 200% of the federal poverty level um, can access that sliding scale. And we know that most of the patients that are served by the health department with Title X services are uninsured um, and they would um, they are qualifying for free or reduced fee care for Title X at the health department. And so they would also benefit from 
um, the integrated care and services that could be provided to them at Heartland. And um, the health center can also address other issues such as the management of chronic diseases, um, including diabetes or hypertension, um, and provide other services to patients that are there for Title X services that might may need dental, behavioral health, other wraparound services that exist at Heartland. Um, as an FQHC, a federally qualified health center, um, we are subject to strict quality and compliance measures. And um, we uh, will be able to provide cost savings for patients for their health care while also maintaining the same pricing that is available for Title X services at the health department. We would be required to offer um, the same you know, discounted fees and free services for patients that are there for a Title X visit. Um, I wanted to just quickly touch on timeline. Um, we are currently um, monitoring current access to care for patients that are in need of services in, fam in the family planning grant. Um, we're creating workflows for same day and next day access to STD and STI testing, um, which will be implemented by next week. We also just purchased some equipment that um, will allow us to be able to offer same day results. And we should have that available by the end of the month. Um, we've seen an uptick in calls already from patients that are needing services at the health department that um, have been calling Heartland. And so we recognize that even though we will not have the grant um, until July, access is needed. And so we've been working closely with our partners at the health department and also at Lawrence Memorial Hospital to ensure that these patients have access to care. Um, the grant application is due on March 15th. We're working on that now. We are working on bolstering staffing um, and plan to add the community health um, facility um, back to our scope of service. And that's just a formal step that we have to take with HRSA so that we can have a care team there. Um, we had a conversation last week with Sarah about um, Heartland resuming um, access to space in the health department uh, clinic space. It's a beautiful space that's been remodeled. Uh, we should use it. And we believe that that's going to really help with the transition because patients are used to going to the health department for that care, and we will be there to provide it. So it will be seamless. Um, funding period starts on July 1. Um, and so starting July 1, we will be ready to be providing these services in the um, community health building. As Dan mentioned, mentioned in his um, presentation, the trend of encounters at the health department um, for services has been declining. And um, Heartland has seen an overall increase in services um, that are eligible for Title X funding by 266%. Um, compared to the health department's decline of 18%. Um, grant funding is also based on an encounter rate. Um, and so we believe that we may actually be able to get more funding um, than the health department has been able to get in, in past years. And that's not a guarantee, but we certainly are going to ask for more because we believe we will see more patients. Um, so that's a little bit um, for you about timeline and our plans and how we are moving forward. So I'd be happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you. I have one about the facility, about the health department facility. Uh, so the, the clinic there has been remodeled. Is it currently empty? When was it remodeled? This might be a Sarah question. What's the timeline of what has or hasn't happened there? So again, I want to state the health department will still have clinic. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, they will continue to provide some clinic services, just not Title X. Um, so the clinic is still going on. There is just space for a for a care team. Um, there's enough space to also hold a care team. Okay. Is that that wow. is very helpful? So it okay. would be a, a shared space. Yes. And would there be a would that be partnership or would they be separate spaces just near each other between Public Health and Heartland Health? Well, it's all in the same clinical area, um, shared but space. yeah, shared space. And I know that when the, the clinic space was remodeled, um, prior to the remodel, Heartland had a care team at the health department, and that was discontinued when COVID um, hit. And so the remodel included, you know, a specific design that included front desk space available for Heartland's care team to come back. 
And so it's an ideal situation for us to both share that clinical space. Thank you. I really appreciate that background. I'm going to turn to other commissioners. Do you have questions or comments? Commissioner Reed, no questions, and I'll, I'll keep my comments for after public comment. Okay. Thank None you. from me. Thank you for being here, Julie. Yep, thanks. At any, so I will go ahead and open this item up for public comment. If anyone would like to speak, you can give us your name and county address. I'm Erica Dvorsky, and I, did you say address? Do, do I don't? out of habit. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I am the vice chair of, of the Lawrence Douglas County Public Health, jointly appointed by the city and the county. And um, my public comment is that I'm aware that we have a leadership transition going on in public, at our public health department. We're currently in the midst of a search. We're also we just recently are working on the strategic plan. We've got a lot of moving parts and pieces. We're also in the midst of a challenging employment environment in case anyone hadn't noticed. Um, and so there's a lot going on and really my presence here is to tell all of you, we are fully engaged. We are fully participating as a board and um, please feel free to reach out if you have questions or if you're concerned about any aspects as we work with our transition, both with Title X as with, and with public health. So I'm also here to answer questions if you want. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any others for a public comment? No one else in the room? Um, Sarah, do we have anyone online that would like to give? No, okay. With that, I will close public comment and bring it back to commissioners. This is Commissioner Reed. Um, thank you all for being there. And um, to those of you who were at the last meeting, it was January 11th when I was virtual. I promise it's not personal <laughs> that I didn't get to be there in person with you again this evening. Um, <clears throat> but thank you all for circling back and um, I just really want to appreciate uh, the health department taking seriously some of the questions that we raised and um, working to provide us with some more context about those questions and I uh, particularly appreciate the efforts around um, organizing some focus groups and reaching out to patients. Um, I know those are not terribly easy in general and, and you did it on a quick turnaround um, but I hope that that was valuable um, for what it's worth. And I think that, you know, even though there's a transition in clinical services um, to some degree that I would just encourage that that be something that the board and future leadership of the health department um, continue to think about and how to regular, regularly seek and uh, engage patient feedback um, and folks who are utilizing services to understand why they come there. Um, and what the strengths are and, and what maybe some suggestions are. So I super appreciate that effort. Um, and then um, my comment to Julie and, and the Heartland team is I appreciate that um, y'all have been in dialogue with us um, as well as continued dialogue with the health department um, since then and appreciate the information that you shared here and put together. And I'm especially um, excited about and grateful to see some real efforts being made to um, create capacity for walk-in availability and to really prioritize the ability um, to provide same day and next day services um, whenever possible for these uh, services in particular. So that is really meaningful to me and I'm excited to see um, how that just works in the future and what the um, sharing of the space at the health department or the community health building um, will look like. So I appreciate that that's also part of the plan and um, hope that that will, um, to Julie's point, really create a more seamless transition. Those are all my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Reed. Uh, Commissioner Kelly, anything? Yeah, I, you know, first of all, I appreciate all the work that's been done and the responsiveness um, to some of our questions. I, I hope it serves a little bit as a cautionary tale. We we in Douglas County have sort of a unique, um, well, it, it's just tricky in that we fund these community partners. 
And these community partners also have their own um, governing boards. And some of them, we appoint people to their governing boards. And I appreciate uh, Erica reaching out and we had a really good conversation about, you know, what's the role of the county commission and the people we appoint to the health board um, and, and sort of what's that relationship? Because I think it has renewed in my mind a, a need to um, have better communication with those that we appoint um, and that um, that we have to be real clear with our community partners that if we're making significant changes, um, because we are a funding mechanism of those organizations, we would like to be involved in, in understanding what's happening there and the choices that are made. Um, we're not taking any action on this tonight, so I, I do want to appreciate all the work that people have done. But I also think that there's more discussions to be had as we come to budget time in July. Um, I, I, I understand Lawrence Douglas County Public Health is making some changes. And I think at our last meeting, Dan said, uh, you know, that, that maybe the same budget request would be made. Um, so I just want to understand that more. And that's maybe when we have a deeper conversation about what services we're providing and where the funding comes from those for those services. Um, I think the city's engagement on that will also be of interest to me. So very pleased in the discussion we're having tonight. want to um, encourage all of us as county commissioners and, and community partners to just keep in contact so that when changes happen, it's not a surprise and we, we have a meeting that maybe didn't look so great in the public as we ask some really tough questions. Thank you, commissioners. I just, for my kind of closing comments, just I'm excited to, or glad to know the that there are still clinic services that will be provided and, and getting some clarity around what those are if, if Title 10 or most of Title 10 does move, move to Heartland. Um, I'm very appreciative for Heartland for stepping up and applying for the grant so that uh, those uh, critical services get funded as they need to for our community. And I, so thank you for that. It's never easy and it's uh, plenty of work and I, I appreciate that. Um, and also just the understanding of the shared space. And so that as um, clinic services are being shifted from one entity to another, that that can be as seamless as possible for the community and how they access those services. So um, I have no further questions or comments. I believe other commissioners have also said what they needed to say. Um, so there's no action item, no action taken on this item. This was for information purposes only. Really appreciate people turning out to, to come and help us understand better and definitely stay in touch and stay in communication. We really appreciate that. So with that, uh, that is the end of our regular agenda. We have, do we have any appointments to talk about tonight, Sarah? Uh, commissioners, I did send you one. Uh, regarding the health board, I don't know if anyone's ready to make that motion tonight or if we want to just continue to think on that one. I have reached out and have not yet fully closed loop and made that conversation happen. So okay. I'm happy to wait on that and give me a moment to, yep. to make that. That I don't have any other pending appointments, commissioners. Okay, with that, um, Commissioner or Administrator Miscellaneous. Uh, thanks, Commissioners. My memo is in the packet today. Um, I do want to uh, just let everybody know we do have a work session next week um, where we're going to kind of kick off our budget process and talk more about our community partner agreements and our work with other um community partners in that process. So I'm hoping that'll be, we're, we're going to ask you lots of questions. So my hope is that we can have an engaging conversation about kind of how we want this year's budget process to go. I also want to update, update the commissioners and the community uh, related to our ongoing work on the treatment recovery center. Um, included in my packet is uh, information regarding the work that we've done over the last week, last Thursday, the 23rd. Oh boy, total typo. I said the 30 earth. 30, 30, 30, uh, county staff and county council um, <laughs> met to continue working on the, the terms for the operating agreement for 90 minutes. Uh, KDADS Commissioner Andy Brown was in attendance for part of those. 
On Monday, the 27th, Bob Triansky and Stephen O'Neill met to review potential key performance indicators for 90 minutes. During that same time frame, county staff and council met with uh, the other Burt Nash staff and council uh, related to the terms of the operating agreement for about an hour. Today, March 1st, county staff and county council met uh, for about another 90 minutes on the operating terms. Um, tomorrow, March 2nd, Patrick Schmitz and I have our weekly one-on-one -on -one check in and we have additional time on the calendar for Friday, March 3rd um, uh, for 90 minutes. We also have additional time next week um, also calendared. Um, commissioners, I'm I'm really uh, pleased to uh, report that you know substantial progress on the key terms uh, that we are making substantial progress on the key terms of the agreement. Um, I believe we are on track with the timeline that we put before the commission a few weeks back. Of course, uh, all of these are draft. I you know draft. Um, Agree, you know, progression. Uh, everything will come back to the Board of County Commissioners for approval and to the uh, Governing Board of Burt Nash for approval as well. But it's uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of weeks, and I, I, I think we are we are making substantial progress now that it is March first. Um, it's it's um, important to note that you know our plan is to bring back um, on March twenty second uh, an update for the commission on uh, the progress on due diligence. Have we, how have we sort of resolved our due diligence items and then report on progress related to the agreement? And then, then we would proceed with our plan is to bring forward a draft operating agreement to the County Commission on April 5th. So just a little over 30 days away. Um, and um, I have that right, I think. Yes. So um, we're on track to to meet those deliverables and appreciate the hard work of um, not only our county team on this, but a uh, number of folks at Burt Nash. And just stand for any questions commissioners might have. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And commissioners, do you have any questions? Commissioner Kelly, I don't. Thank you, Sarah, for your update. Ms. Commissioner Reed, I don't. I also just realized I coughed unmuted. So sorry, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for the update, Sarah. And I would like to thank our team and the Burt Nash team for the huge number of hours and the difficult conversations that are being had. Uh, negotiation is is always tough. And I just appreciate the uh, the heart that is going into those discussions on all sides. So thank you. And then just a reminder that we aren't meeting on the 15th, since there are five Wednesdays that month, the commissioners to, uh, decided to take the 15th off. Okay. Commissioners, do you have any other miscellaneous items for tonight? I don't. Nope. Sarah, nothing else? Nope. With that, we are adjourned, and thank you all for joining us.